whoever is watching this adventure in archaeology. Myself is Dr. Prakash Sina from Allahabad University. I am trying to understand the prehistoric life through different techniques, using different methods and research designs. Whatever I learned so far as the question of use wear or microwear analysis is concerned, or in broader sense, the functional analysis, I would like to share with you. And therefore, I propose the topic for my today's talk is why study microwear attributes or why scan microwear attributes? What we mean by the microwear? These are the some puzzling problems and especially what I would like to deliver today or discuss with you or share with you different approaches to the functional analysis or microwear analysis, procedure of microwear analysis, Limitations of microwave analysis. Microwave analysis, one case study, and why scan microwave attributes and its applications. So these are some four or five points on which I would like to focus today. Now the basic question is who I am? Who am I? Just a stone piece? or we have some symbols hidden in it. If symbols are hidden, then how to retrieve them? That is the basic problem. As you can see, I, I don't know how much clear, picture is clear, but I think that at least you will get some idea. This is one hand -ex. Hand -ex, why a hand -ex? Because the archaeologist called such pieces as a hand -ex. As my parents gave me name, Prakash. When you know everybody, most of the uh, students who came to my classes, they must have realized that there is no light in me, only darkness, because still I am understanding the problems of prehistory. But my parents gave me the name. But similarly, in archaeology, archaeologists give different names to different objects. Sometimes on the basis of their present knowledge and sometimes on just morphological features and analogy with certain objects known to them. Similarly, this picture is a hand -ex. But what hand -ex? What it suggests to us? If I say this is a chopper, it, mean, it means to us a lot. If I say it is a sword, it means to lot. But unless until we know the function of this piece, it will be very difficult to know the activities would, that would have been carried out by this type of pieces. So that is the main problem in this archaeology, not only in the prehistory, but also in proto-historical archaeology also. Lithic artifacts represents one of the most important clues to understand prehistoric life ways and that actually laid the foundation of subsequent cultures sub subsequent from simple culture to the complex culture or complex societies behavioral development and cognitive process that would have led to the development of cognitive ecosystem because man was not living not is living in a natural only in a natural environment but he lives in an environment created by him or by the society and therefore i coined this term the cognitive ecosystem of cognitive ecology or cognitive environment one of the most basis of topology technique and statistical analysis archaeologists have been classifying the contents of the archaeological sites, assemblages, and attributing them to archaeological cultures. So this is the background on which we classify archaeological cultures. However, one of the goal of the archaeological studies is to know the systematic context or dynamic context of the archaeological context of the dead context. 
that hardly possible unless until we know the function and function knowing the function of the artifacts is very very important because we, without knowing them it will be very difficult what type of the activities were going on at the sites or in archaeological landscape there is always some meaning behind normal human action and to understand rational behind his or her action one should understand the process of culture construct so contextual archaeological evidence in time and space this understanding may be achieved or accomplished through experimental archaeology what i believe so far my experience is time now one there are certain issues one should keep in mind were all the lithic assemblies recovered in spatial and temporal dimensions products of equally skilled snapper nappers were they made by all equally skilled make manufacturers were there no learners without learners how they how one generation can pass a knowledge to the other gen and the other generation were all the lithic artifacts intentionally made to meet some task or sometimes accidentally they use some natural object does the development of human behavior unilateral and linear but i believe that that the development of human behavior is not unilateral rather multi structural multilateral and spiral in time and space and that prob probably when we think that it is a linear unilateral that creates a problem for of periodization in archaeology or in history as well at a more pragmatic level it implies that there is some complex structural thinking process which links the possible visual patterns which links the possible which links the uh, indeed until unless we are able to know the function of the tools it will be very difficult if not possible impossible to construct the prehistoric economy and cognitive map of an archaeological period in the region markovery study on the uh, uh, study can provide attributes to synthesize not only the function of the tools but may also enlighten us on the instruments and gears used to exploit material culture in the region during a particular archaeological period and what we get as a cultural material analytical procedures have contributed sig significantly in this direction such as ethnographical parallels means archaeologists compare on the basis of ethnography with the archaeological pieces and they try to understand the function or the probable activity at the site then there was another approach that is edge damage pattern the damages damage pattern on the edges they compared it with the archaeological pieces but they they forget that the that the in archaeological pieces it is very very difficult to distinguish between the functional damages or damages caused because of the function or use and because of the tampering or other natural processes then there was a third stage that was a, a edge angle they, they started measuring the edge angle but this again proved to be not satisfactory because when we use one artifact its angles keep on changing and what archaeologists get we get the residue or used artifact and then we measure the angle which hardly suggests what would have been the actual angle at the beginning of the use then comes the kinetic movement of the tools the motion or direction of the tools that help us whether the tools would have been uh, used as a saw or, or cutting tools or chopping tools but not beyond that then comes the killers important work after uh, semnaus work of kinetic movement 
that is the high and low power microscopy. And here we use two types of the microscope. When we magnify, uh, when we observe objects under 100 or below 100 magnification, we say low power microscopy and above 100, we say the high power microscopy. And with the help of this, the killer got success in identifying the polishes of the worked material. And that is a very important contribution after Semenov's kinetic movements or styrations marks uh, or age damage pattern. Then comes the image processing technique, the application of the computer in archaeology to understand, to distinguish different types of the polishes or different types of the uh, styrations marks. And nowadays, we, what we follow is a multi-dimensional approach. We follow all these attributes, all these type of the approaches, and then we draw some conclusion about the function of the tools. Recently, or say uh, uh, two or more, a little more than two decades, from two decades, the people have now started observing or analyzing the residue on the edges of the tools. And with the help of that, they try to figure out the function of the tools. And that I will discuss later. The, what are the aims of the Markovel studies? The aim of the Markovel study is to reconstruct as completely as possible the primary economic activities and behavior of prehistoric groups. Following a systematic procedure of microanalysis, scholars have not only inferred the function of the lithic tools, but also about the economic cognition and cognitive ecosystem of an archaeological landscape. So the function analysis is not only limited to uh, up to the, uh, the function of the one single object or the objects, but also about to reconstruct the cognitive the cognition of the people and cognitive the uh, ecosystem of that time. The microscopic study of Wear pattern on humanly made artifacts is a microwear analysis. These wears may be due to various factors, such as alteration in the course of manufacturing artifacts. When we manufacture artifacts, sometimes we rub the edges or the platform, and sometimes when we hit a stone with the hammer, it, it slips and that is smash the surface of the artifact. And that creates some uh, changes, some abrasion, some styration marks on the stone tools. So we have to identify that wear also, and what is not commonly known as technical wears, and what the uh, newcomer call it a spontaneous retouch. Then alteration due to use, that is use wear, which we are, we are interested, and we, we want to identify use wear, uh, use wear attributes out of the natural wears. And the third is the natural, the wear or alteration caused because of the natural agencies like the soil movement, trampling marks, and all this creates some wear, uh, wear and tear on the surfaces of the tools. And that we have to distinguish from the use wear. And then only we can say that, well, this is the use wear, and therefore this would have been the function of the tools. It would be therefore better to designate such microscopic study as a microanalysis instead of generally used term lithic use wear analysis. Now, how how to identify different <coughs> wears patterns like use natural wear, use wear, and uh, um, use wear, natural wear, and uh, and uh, uh, this technical wears. So the way is the experiment, double of experimental catalog. And in the, that experimental catalog, we have to keep in mind to generate natural wears. Then when you manufacture artifacts, when you replicate artifacts, flakes, blades, or uh, um, shape tools, then you observe them under the microscope and record all the changes made in the process of manufacturing such tools. Such, such uh, uh, attributes will be classified in our record as a technical wears. 
and for the natural bias for trampling marks or soil movement we create we throw the uh, pieces on the surface where the people are moving so that trampling damages may be recorded or we uh, buried them on the soil so that the soil movement soil pressure may create all what type of uh, different types of the damage that that we record in our uh, experimental catalogs so this way we develop a varieties of the wear patterns on the surface and then we use them on different material so that we can develop some wear pattern so for the natural wear for the wear caused because of the uh, artifacts uh, movement of the water or the soil or the just wind so we develop this type of wears in the lab and then we develop a catalog of natural wears and that help us in distinguishing uh, such wears from the uh, used wears. Then now <coughs> the experimental, first we collect the raw material, we bring the raw material, then we manufacture artifacts and we record the changes, smashing because of the hammer or just to change the, the platform angle we remove certain flakes and that also creates a wear pattern or abrasion on the surface of the tools. Then we prepare a number of flakes and blades and shape tools and then we try to use them on different material, work material. So we, and I, uh, we identify which, which flakes or blade or shape tools will go better uh, for different types of the task. <coughs> Then we accordingly, if we are not going to use them in hand the, or we want to have them to just to protect our fingers or thumb, then we prepare some handles or um, uh, handles to hold them as a composite tools. Then, then we select them for different shapes of the uh, handles or hafts. Accordingly, we select them and again, we have to modify when we fit into handles. So again, there will be some uh, manufacturing wears or uh, technical wears. And then we fix in the glue so that we can use two or three or more blade and flakes in one handle as a composite tools. And then we use them on different for different tasks like chopping, cutting grasses, uh, or whittling. Some whittling means just as we prepare the um, uh, pencil. So this way, we do for different tasks, we use them. So generate the use wear pattern on the uh, experimental pieces. And ultimately, what is left in archaeology? In archaeology, we get only these pieces, the stones, only stones. All these wooden pieces, perishable material get lost. So what we get only this, we don't know whether the tool was hafted or not, how they were using them, for what purpose they were using them, whether they were making knife or sickle, or whether they were using uh, single pieces holding in hand, or whether they were uh, uh, protecting their, uh, their fingers by uh, putting latex on the one of the edge of the tool. So all these features we can understand through the microwear analysis. And this whole process, what uh, you saw just now, is commonly known as nowadays is a chain report here. So we have to move from here up to the basket level, the first slide, up to the basket level. Then, then only we can reconstruct the whole process of manufacturing tools and using of this these tools so the now the, there are some questions the, regarding the polish formations and it's still not well understood how this polish get formed the process some say abrasive but chemical analysis researchers suggest simple abrasion is unlikely to be the only wear process some say that this is a silica dissolution model and some say this is a coating of the work material nothing is 
very positive or one uh, scholars are agreeing on one point but definitely some some sort of the policy developed which distinct which can be distinguished through the microscopic or high power microscopy uh, into different types of the polishes different types of the work material then this residue analysis it is good that you, you with the help of this uh, residue analysis you can figure out the opening material which is um, uh, adherent to uh, the edges of the work uh, edges of the tools but how we can be sure that this this opening material which we extracted from the edges of the tools was because of the used or maybe a post used process uh, maybe maybe the result of the post use process moreover even if we worked out and we realized that okay whatever we extracted our new material is, is because of the use wear then the question is only we will be able to know the work material but we don't know whether they they uh, how they process that work material because the processing of that work material will again tell us more about the uh, behavior of the uh, human beings and therefore again if you look at the literature we will find the residue analysis first they extract the residue uh, the residue from the edges of the tooth and then they follow the high power microscopy to understand the function or kinetic movement of the tooth so this is a double way process then i developed one uh, technique actually this was in 1978 uh, strauss and walker developed this technique of replica replica like it was the dentist used for to replicate uh, the dentition and the same chemical was used to replicate and now i got some success especially for the quartzite and quartz material which uh, are not good for the microscopic study and uh, we, we uh, if we replicate uh, the edges of the say for example the hand dex or cleaver and then we observe under the microscope then we can say something more about the functions of the quartzite tools also so this is also one of the method which is still in a developing process so that we can uh, go up to the reliability of 70 to 80 percent then microwave study can provide attributes to synthesize not only the function of the tools but may also enlighten us on the instruments and gears used to exploit material culture in the region during a particular archaeological period so just for example how the handles whether the handles uh, whether they use the tools in handheld or they have kept them or they protected the single finger uh, by placing the latex on the one edge or short handle long handle because all these different types of straight handle or sickle type shape handle they all changes the microwave attributes and, uh, and if we can have a good catalog of different types of the handles and uh, then we can also identify what type the handle would have been used by the prehistoric men say for example the sickle type uh, where the five blades were adapted and used as a sickle to cutting the grasses and then we got some microwear uh, some microwear uh, attributes on the edges of the tools and then they were observed and recorded uh, properly uh, in, in the record books uh, and then say this is a sickle then we have a little bit less curved handle and again the process and then a little bit more straight so these were different types of handles were used and we what we noticed that different types of attributes uh, handles create uh, the blades fitted on in them creates a different types of the attributes and if you have a good record uh, you have, you have, you have uh, con if you quantify them such type of the experiments you can have a good data base to identify them in archaeological uh, uh, specimens also so this uh, this you can record properly and say for the long blade a single blade just for whittling a, a single blade used just to protect the finger and just a single uh, blade without using any type of the latex used uh, free hand handheld so this type of different types of attributes uh, 
you, you can record uh, by doing different types of uh, experiments and then you properly record them and then you uh, what you do microscopically you have analyzed in the beginning through the small magnifying glasses and then put them under the microscope to see the details of the micro uh, wear or use wear attributes here you will find uh, technical wears use wear as well as natural wears also but in the case of uh, experimental catalog you will not get natural wears only technical wears and the use wear then you record all like a cutting the sickle type of the handle then knives <coughs> straight cutting through knife not sickle handle then you record them attributes in like a knife then single piece with the latex because if latex is there then you can you uh, use them of uh, you uh, with the pressure also because now your finger is safe but if it is handheld then you will not use more pressure to just to protect your finger so the pressure is less in this in this case in comparison to the above figure so that also created different types of the wear pattern then you record finger protected hafting or handheld hafting and then different types of attributes you record uh, during the cutting process or cutting activities and similarly you can uh, record uh, different uh, microwave attributes for other activities like whittling, stepping, slicing, <coughs> etc. <coughs> Observe variations in the location and distribution, shape or polish, type of edge damage, pattern and age of stylations are also probably because of the impact caused by variation in the pressure because if sickle and long handle we create a different type of the pressure handheld we uh, create a different type of pressure that so this pressure creates different types of the uh, use wear damages of microwave uh, attributes forces and, and the leverage is due to the different mode of the holding whose besides other factors like work material so work material will definitely play important hard material soft material will create a different type of the edge damage pattern is styration marked as well as the polish but the lever the hafting um, or composite tool that also we create a different types of the pattern location and edge damage pattern styration marks and the distribution of the polishes uh, of the work material may reveal reasons of various tactics of holding tools and their adaptation and development in a spatial and temporal dimensions. So why we have different types of variation, why this one one side, at first one side we have higher frequency of one type of the tool in comparison to the other sides in the same reason or in different reason. Retrieving such attributes may help us in developing models to reconstruct substance strategies and economy of the prehistoric people in the time and space to understand the process of transforming material culture into cultural material what we recovered in the archaeological explorations and excavation and cognition behind temporal and spatial modification in instruments and gears since each generation is the prototype for the next generation so this way this knowledge keep on going from one generation to other generation and in between the innovations by individuals creates changes in um, in this uh, in the technology as well as the social system this these are the some unused pieces without having no polish on the edges of the tools no 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 polish on the edges of the tools now in the case of the plant polishes the kile got success in identifying hard plants and soft plants but i got some success in distinguishing the plant polishes at least in the five subcategories like i what i call a type b type c and d a for palm type material b for bamboo type c for grass type and d for pandanus leaves and the e for the factors type of the material so 
why I got success, I will discuss later. And uh, with the help of this, this I I able to distinguish such type of the differences in the polishes in archaeological specimens as well. This is the palm type of uh, row is of um, uh, experimental pieces and below is the archaeological pieces. Just I'm showing the comparison. This is a bamboo. This is a grass. You can see the polishes. And this is on archaeological pieces. There are some pandanus leaves in archaeological as well as experimental pieces. Then antler, meat, hide, these are the polishes on archaeological as well as experimental pieces. This is a shell polish. How cutting a shell or boring a shell creates polish on the edges of the tools. These are hafting marks in archaeological pieces. This brownish patch. And along with this patch, we have zigzag as absurd uh, styration pattern and some damages as well. These are the archaeological pieces showing uh, slicing or cutting meat and bone polishes at 10, 20 magnifications. This, this, this is the shell boring. You can see the styration marks. Some are rounded and some are going perpendicular, angular. So that shows the boring activity uh, by these tools. And the polish suggests that this was a shell. Similarly, the scrapping B type or bamboo type scrapping. When we, when we use a piece on for scrapping uh, like bamboo or palm, the edge get rounded. But not to that uh, extent as we see in the uh, scrapping the height. Height, in the case of height, edge get rounded very fast. This is the grinding marks. You, if you look at the neurolists, you will find much grinding marks like this because the neurolists were finally grinded to uh, remove all the uh, ridges of the earlier flaking. This is again, I uh, the drilling the antler, the white snowy type of the polish, the styration marks. Then this is height, just you uh, see the rounding of the edge. It is almost round or blunt. So these are the uh, some examples from the archaeological pieces. This is my just lab. It has been suggested that all materials, the scholars are of the view that all materials produce the same, some polish during the early stages of tool use. And then as work progresses, the polishes develop separately through overlapping dust occur. And consequently, a model of polish development as a continuum has been adopted. Hence, the multi-dimensional approach to use where analysis is required. So, what we will say that when we start using a piece on different work material, then initially the polish are different, but at the end the polish seems appear similar. So that is the problem why people fail to distinguish between different types of the polishes. But what I feel that this is not because of there is no uh, microtopographic differences in different uh, uh, polishes, but because of our technique, because intensity of light, in, especially in the high power, because with the help of high power microscopy, only you can identify the polishes. So intensity of the light varies with the magnification in both in re reflected and transmitted light observations or microscopes. At higher magnification, it's difficult for human eyes to distinguish polishes, and that is the problem. Uh, that is why the artists fail to distinguish after a certain time when they, they magnify the magnifications. Proposed, I, therefore, I propose to record observation of micro topography at each magnification, say, for example, 5x, 10x, 20 times, and then 40 times. 
and then you will find the changes and then you can distinguish the polish one and this is the way why i got success in distinguishing the plant polishes into at least uh, so far the five types of the polishes a b c d and e f one may resolve the issue of continuum and may be able to distinguish used polishes the main problem with the high power microscopy uh, microwear analysis is that the description of the distinctive polishes are subject so say for example i call this polish as this appears like a snow some say it is a hillock type or some say it is a fluid snow or creamy or greasy or pitted surface and therefore this uh, nomenclature varies from the analyst to analyst and that their problem when we wish to compare the material so that <coughs> and therefore it is very difficult for an independent worker to attend, uh, to uh, to use earlier workers work therefore the problem before us is how to uh, minimize this type of the problem or subjective problem what at present i am with the help of my uh, friend professor ashish khare of uh, computer and electronics department of university of allahabad are trying to develop a new method using artificial computer uh, skill uh, so with the help of the support vector machine and uh, uh, matlab algorithms to distinguish this uh, type of the polishes on the basis of the photographs taken by the high power microscopy so that we can minimize the subjectivity and we can give a scientific or mathematical uh, nomenclature to this type of the polish as you can see that this is a grass uh, cutting polish this is microscopic photograph and here is what we will develop through this technique or this uh, method support vector machine and matlab algorithms so now we got success that about 80% we are correct but still there are problems to distinguish natural wear used wear when they both are present uh, on the archaeological pieces still we are changing or developing the algorithms so that we in the near future we will be able to uh, solve this problem and then this type of the uh nomenclature what we are developing of course we are developing with help will definitely help the analyst to uh, compare the material from our uh, analyzed by different scholars this is another example of same this is a bamboo type polish and then here we have uh, mathematically developed pattern from uh, this support vector machine using computer intelligence artificial intelligence now i come to the case study uh, here i am using the uh, material uh, what i analyze uh, of kanul uh, case and here i want to recall and again thanks our beloved professor mlk murthy uh, who provided me this material for analysis and very interesting results came out of this analysis and th this is mainly focus on uh, Mushratala Tintamani Gavi 2, a uh, Mesolithic of Upper Late Upper Paleolithic site. On the basis of this analysis, there are some important interpretations have been made uh, regarding site. The total percentage of the articles with the used wears uh, out of the 95 artifacts were 43.2%. And out of the shape tools, modified pieces, and uh, unmodified pieces, 61%. 26 or 27 percent and 12 percent were used respectively <clears throat> and this is a um, uh, typological classification of these used uh, pieces and then what we noticed that activities main activities were the cutting followed by the boring and whittling activities and then scrapping and there are some composite activities also where the more than two activities by a single piece was carried out there are some pieces where whittling as well as cutting both were done or scrapping and cutting was done like this and now this is 
of the same pieces. This is the functional uh, tool type category. And earlier, if you have noticed that there were 17 types of types based on the morphological features. Now, after function analysis, only seven types are there. Borer, uh, whittling, scrappers, cutting and whittling, cutting and chopping, slicing, and cutting. So these are the uh, functional categories of the same pieces. And uh, it seems that the uh, cave people using these tools exploited both the vegetal and non-vegetal work material. They, they most likely used these tools on palm, bamboo, grasses, pantanous leaves, meat, bone, and shells. I, it is interesting to note that uh, this, uh, when I was analyzing the material of the uh, number of sites of the Belen Valley, Son Valley, I was not getting any D type polish. That, that means the pendulous types of uh, leaf types of the polish. The moment I analyzed, uh, started analyzing this uh, kernel material, I found pendulous types of the polish also, or D type of the polish also. And then I saw uh, the literature and I found that this type of plants are present in that region. And therefore, that's again support my identification that that. that uh, it means that there is definitely a micro uh, topographic differences between different polishes and my identification to some certain uh, level of the confidence are correct that the pendulous types of the polishes are present in the case of the kernel material. And then we found meat, bone and shell type of the polishes on these pieces. These are the, some uh, archaeological pieces of the kernel with the uh, use we are uh, uh, we, we use your attributes and uh, that's a truncated and back blade with a type of the palm, palm cutting type of the polishes are there. <coughs> then there are at 100 magnification and below is a 200 magnifications. Similarly, here we have perquire, boring, bamboo, which direction marks suggest the boring activity. Then we have uh, again uh, retouch the modified bed boring B type. Here we have styration marks. Yeah. Again we have whittling activity, cutting whittling activity on the retouch the modified pieces. It means that neither they are shaped pieces nor waste. So they are retouched and modified pieces. Partially bagged blades, cutting activities, or cutting seed type of the uh, plants like grasses, etc. Just you see the 550 magnification, 100 magnification, and 200 magnification. The polish become very flat, the snowy. Some call it snowy, some some kind of fluid type polish or mercury type of the polish. So that is the basic difference uh, so far as uh, the question of uh, giving the name of different types of the polishes, micro topography of the polishes. And then we have uh, straight back blades, slicing D type of pandanus, very greasy, greasy type of the polish uh, found in the kernel care material, not found in the Bago, Tri, Nan, Kala, Chopni, Mando, this type of the size. No, 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 uh, there are some pieces in the Dhola Vira also that are upon sides. This is again the straight back cutting bone. This is cutting bone. Then we have a convex back blade cutting shell type of the material. Look at this styration marks. The cutting marks. Here is the styration mark running almost parallel to the edge of the tool. So the good number of the tools, about 63.5% were used on the vegetal material, which includes polish like A, that is palm type, bamboo type, grasses, and pendulous leaves. Since most of the tools used on the vegetal work material have either A, B, D type of the polishes, therefore they would have been used more likely 
exploiting material culture not for subsistence because bamboo is there, pandanus leaves are there, they are not most likely not edible material, uh, rather for making objects like handles, hats, sticks, strips, mats, baskets, hairpins, etc. Activities which are usually associated with uh, objects making uh, constitute about 39% boring, 24% whittling, and about 2.4% uh, slicing, <coughs> as well as a whittling activity 12.2%. They are making objects not only of palm, bamboo, pandanus, but also of the bone and shells. The remaining uh, activities, about 56.6%, uh, like cutting, cutting and whittling, cutting and chopping, and slicing, might have been used for both processing food and making objects. And therefore, how to distinguish them? How much of them is for the uh, making objects and how much of them are processing food? There comes other attributes, microwave attributes, which we recorded. Other microwave attributes such as types of the edge damage, scars, depth of the scars, width and depth of the styration, intensity of edge damage, etc. suggest that nearly 68.3% most probably used for make out of this used for object making and remaining 31.7 percent for food processing and therefore the majority of the tools were used for manufacturing objects or craft activities artifacts having microwave attributes identified as happening are about 34 percent means good number of the pieces what happened these are the some uh, observation dig dig line with blackish spots suggest that some resins were used and they were hafted in angles. Generally truncated and back blades would have been used for boring and piercing activities because the truncation is very important for cutting. Oh sorry, for boring activities. Similarly the triangles perquire and some straight back blades <coughs> as having slightly trapping ends were also used for boring and piercing activities. Generally lunate and convex back, lunate almost same because if bulb is there, uh, there it is a convex back, if there is no bulb then it is a lunate. So that is the basic difference between lunate and convex, both have a back, uh, one edge is completely back. So the lunate and convex back blades complete or fragment used for cutting and especially for harder material. It seems to me that functionally the image of junction formed as a result of truncation technique was in prehistoric cognition of mind and not whether the tool is geometric or not, as usually in the archaeologist's cognition. But they were not identifying or using the tools uh, by the name of the triangles or trapeze or truncated. For them, the angle was very important and accordingly they were selecting and using them for different tasks. It is mathematically proved that the pressure or force if applied on convex surface congregate and more control on the contact area, especially in cutting activities, hence they would have cognated to manufacture convex back blades or lunettes to cut harder work material like bone, shell, or dry bamboo, etc. Hafting attributes suggest that they were hafting tools, making composite tools in wooden handles made of a bamboo palm because what we noticed that along with this uh, hafting uh, zigzag pattern or hazard pattern of styration marks and damages, we found the polishes associated with this or the palm or bamboo that, that suggests that their handle would have been uh, preferably of the bamboo and the palm. <clears throat> their cutting, whittling and slicing tools may consist of one or more blades or plates or shaped tools fitted in handles and glues with the latex, but probably boring and scraping tools were held or hafted single.
to protect fingers if hand held they would have been covering holding sides with the glue or latex so this is perhaps would have been the case in the um, uh, so far as the those pieces uh, which were used for um, different activities are concerned whether they were hafted and hafted in different types of the shapes of the handles there here are some technical marks also this hammer is smash of the hammer and that hammer is of antler not stone so this polish suggests that they were using antler or soft hammer to manufacture tools but the but the problem here is the technical wear observed clearly suggests that they were applying both types of the hammer stones as well as antler no trace of antler or hide polishes on examined artifacts even when evidence suggests that tools were made by antlers as well as uh, and are present in the exposed assemblage at the site need to be in reinvestigated because why we are not getting the polishes on the tools and that suggests that we have to reinvestigate the whole process or more uh, artifacts should be observed does this suggest or it may be the other reasons also does this suggest that it may antler tools and the processing hide some other technique was practiced or or such at, uh, activities were done at some other site or other place other location maybe because of the economical and social importance and protecting secrecy of the technology because preparation of hide would have been a, a, a technique different technique similarly making tools out of antler would have been a different uh, technique and antler would have been a very costly uh, item and therefore they would have been hiding this technique and therefore they would have selected some place close to maybe close to their habitational area uh, but at different place therefore we are not getting them in archaeological or uh, in the caves of, of, of which the material has been analyzed uh, they may they were making objects on bones and shell along with the plants like handles for composite tools like sickles knife handles for um, borers spoke shapes baskets pins spears bows and arrows uh, mats different types of the traps etc why different types because ethnographic travel uh, as reported by professor murthy late professor murthy suggests that uh, yarukulas and bears tribes use a variety of the hunting gears uh, like net traps spiral traps gravity traps and multiple loose traps and manufacturing of these items require bamboo cord and wood and therefore it suggests that they were also making different types of the uh, n- n- uh, different types of the nest also or trapping uh, gears also inhabitants of the cave were most probably hunters and gatherers they were most probably especially in the light of the good number of the bones and pillar and shell polishes in the excavated materials in in, in adjoining regions like uh, mr talag and tindaman gavi uh, one and a good number of the meat bone and shell polishes in two mcg2 suggest that they were preferring hunting to gathering for the subsistence Determining such attributes may help us in developing models to reconstruct subsistence strategies and economy of prehistoric people in time and space, and to understand the process of transforming material culture into cultural material and cognition behind temporal and spatial spatial modification in instruments and gears. <clears throat> that therefore I say that. the development of human behavior is not unilateral rather multilateral multistructural and spiral in time and space now some applications beside this what we discussed so far the variability between the assemblies in terms of activities that took place at the sites then age analysis can group the tools into types having similar functional capabilities that is group the tools are held to be associated with 
a particular activity but without necessarily specifying exactly what the activity is. Therefore, one can construct a functional topology that can be quantitatively compared with the other assemblies in order to ascertain the similarity, similarities or differences in activities represented at different sites. Another way in which the use via analysis can be used on whole assemblies is to attempt to interpret the function of a site as a whole in the terms of the range of activities that were carried out at the sites. And similarly, if we carry out similar type of the analysis on number of sites in one given uh, uh, archaeological landscape, then we can reconstruct the total cognitive environment of cognitive ecosystem at the site and the whole picture about what was happening in one particular archaeological period in that region. Knowing the range of the activities would help to interpret the function of the site as a home base, hill site, hunting station, specialist activity site like this. We, then only we can understand whether what was happening at the site. The, the kind of analytical process described above could be applied to an assembly in order to interpret the substance strategy associated with a particular site. The separation of the tools into those used on soft or hard material would give an estimation of the importance of the vegetable resources as opposed to the hunting resources. A second area in which the user analysis can be profitably utilized is to approach a specific problem associated with the particular tool types like back. Back may be a piercer, may be as a use as a borer. And initially that would have been made, uh, they would have made a back, but later on because of the use they convert, that converted into the borer and the archaeologists will classify them as a borer. So, but with the help of the microwave, we can identify the initial shape or initial uh, idea behind the manufacturing such tools. Use the analysis should not be seen as a technique that is intended to supplant existing methods of the lithic analysis, but to supplement lithic analysis as a whole. And there I end and thank you very much. There is one question. There is one question by Rohan Mathur. He said that how to distinguish between natural and artificially made tools. Look, artificial tool will have certain pattern. 
and localized localized pattern say for example you say the accidental tool then how can we say that this is a tool first is that what we call a tool first we call them simply the artifacts tools are those which have been either made or shaped in certain way or they were used for certain work only those pieces classified as a tools so when we use some, some pieces say for natural piece we just started using them so then we will have wear tear different type of the, looking at that we can say that this, this here is a pattern and therefore we this is a in, intentionally used piece similarly if you are manufacturing some tools then i will intentionally remove some flakes from one particular area not from the whole area in the case of the natural pieces you will find this this phenomena on the almost whole of the surface and not only on one piece but on different material lying in that adjoining area so intentionally made tools or man made tools will be localized phenomena not a, as a uh, as a whole a whole area phenomena in nature in nature hardly act, uh, carry out activity at one meter square meter or 20, or uh, say 10 by 20, 20 meter uh, square area but it will be more than that and so there you will see not only this you will see as a pattern of removal of the flakes and that pattern having some intention behind that will be clearly reflected the moment you will gain some experience in analyzing and differentiating natural versus the uh, natural versus uh, intentionally made artifacts Well, Pragya Pandey, the your question is if the tool is used for more than one activity, how we will distinguish your your you suggested uh, activities like cutting and whittling? It depends upon if it will it will be very easy for the analyst to distinguish whittling and cutting if they were carried out on different edges. But say for example, if they were carried out on one edge only. In, maybe initially they started with the cutting and then they started whittling activity. The, the, this you can get by analyzing the styration marks and the formation, polished formation. The whittling activity will not involve whole of the edge or length of the piece. But in the case of cutting, maximum length will be involved. And therefore, you, what you will find, you will find the styration marks, especially running parallel to the edge. And in certain place where uh, the area of the, the tool which was, would have been used for the whittling, you will find only localized wear pattern or styration marks. And that will not be a parallel to the edge, rather with certain angles. And they will, there you will find more damage because of the earlier cutting activity and then the whittling activity and this will give a different type of pattern in this area in comparison to the other area which was only used for the cutting and this way you can uh, identify whether this uh, this tool was used or this one particular age was used for more than one activity or not if they are they, they use right and left for separate activity it is very very easy to distinguish only the problem will be when we, uh, the same age was used for two or one, more than one activity. Then again another another question by the Rohan Mathur and that said that tools have any blood stain marks. Have then what will it show? The first thing is that, as I said, the residual uh, analysis. Some people are doing, some scholars are doing very good work for uh, residue analysis. But the micro uh, bacteria, they also destroy this type of the organic material. Temperature, moisture, they also change 
the whole uh, uh, chemical properties of the uh, organic materials. Now the stains, if luckily if you get the blood stains, first you have to identify the blood stain is there or not. If there is a blood stain is there, then it depends upon <clears throat> whether you are you will be able to differentiate between human blood or the animal blood. If you 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 got success in this thing, then you can interpret accordingly. And then the question is not only the blood, but where that blood strain is uh, present. If it is present on the middle of the uh, uh, stone object or stone tool, then it may be a post. Or if it is on the edges or within the uh, damages, scars, the flex, then you can say that well this is um, this may be because of some activity like cutting activities the blood means maybe of if of, of the animals then you can say that the, this animal was butchered or cut uh, or uh, cut, cut into the pieces with the help of this blade or this tool <clears throat> if in the case of human beings maybe maybe because of the some fight or maybe accidental uh, accidentally man cut his fingers or some other parts of his body. So this way we can differentiate it, but provided you 100% show that this is the blood. There is another question by Pragya Pandey to identify which activity is earlier than uh, the later one. It, 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 your styration marks and damage pattern will tell what is in last on the surface top of the uh, edges of the tools or surface of the working edge will be the later and the earlier one will be uh, other one will be the earlier one. Because last, if you say, for example, if you are getting parallel station overlapping the uh, angular stations, <coughs> then you can say that whittling was done first and then cutting. And reverse is the case, then you can say cutting was done first and whittling is later. 